going to be talking about our paper, High Accuracy and High Fidelity Extraction of Neural Networks. This is joint work with Nicholas Carlini, David Bricolo, Alex Karakin, and Nicolas Paperno. This work was done while all of us were at Google Research, but I've since moved back to my home institution of Northeastern University, and Nicola has moved to University of Toronto. Our talk starts with a common setup, machine learning as a service. Digitco has trained a very good handwritten digit recognition model, and Alice is willing to pay to use it. Alice identifies some handwritten five, sends it to Digitco, Digitco runs it through the model, finds out it's a five, and sends that information back to Alice. However, if Alice is malicious, she can use this input-output interaction to steal the model. This attack is known as model extraction and is the focus of our talk. Today, I'm going to be discussing three parts of our paper. A taxonomy we introduced for model extraction and improvements to two types of extraction attacks, learning-based extraction and direct recovery extraction. To start with the taxonomy, we need to figure out why someone would do model extraction. The first reason, we argue, is that data, compute, labels, and engineers are expensive. And an adversary might try to avoid paying for these things by stealing someone else's model. We call this adversary theft motivated. On the other hand, models have security and privacy properties. And so stealing the model might be a way to improve the attacks that can be run. We call this adversary a reconnaissance motivated adversary. Key thrust of our paper is that these are two different adversaries and they have two fundamentally different goals. The theft-motivated adversary cares about accuracy. They want good accuracy on the target task. On the other hand, a reconnaissance-motivated adversary um, cares about matching the particularities of the specific target model. They care about fidelity. In the limit, if you want the outputs to match for all inputs, um, this adversary is called functionally equivalent. This isn't the only axis of interest for a taxonomy of model extraction, but you're going to have to see the paper for more details. Now that we know why someone might do model extraction, let's figure out how. We'll start by describing a simple case, a linear model. The natural thing that someone might do is you query on 100 points, you now have 100 outputs, now do machine learning on those input-output pairs. Machine learning is designed to identify the relationship between inputs and outputs, so this is going to be good. But also notice that for a linear model, and specifically, if you query on all zeros except the first input is a 1, you've recovered the first coordinate of the weight. Um, if you query on all zeros except the second coordinate is 1, you recover the second coordinate of the weights. Doing this, you can recover the linear model exactly by doing this for every coordinate. These are um, essentially the same thing for linear models, but they capture two different philosophies of model extraction. The first is machine learning philosophy. I have a lot of inputs and outputs. Uh, let me learn the relationship. The other is I know the functional form of the model that I'm trying to steal, um, but I don't know the secret. And so I'm going to steal the secret in this sort of cryptanalytic way. Um, neural networks are where these two philosophies really diverge, and I'll talk about that in the remainder of the talk, starting with our improvements to learning-based extraction. So with learning-based extraction, um, it works fairly out of the box, so the main object of interest is improving the query efficiency of it. And we push that by using semi-supervised learning in our paper. In semi-supervised learning, uh, one has a small label data set, and a large unlabeled data set. And the goal was to use them both to produce a model that's better than if you just had the labeled data set. The main drawback of this is that you need this unlabeled data set. But for a theft motivated adversary, we argue that this is actually a reasonable assumption. You had a lot of points you wanted to query the model on anyways, you just didn't want to pay for all of them. So now you can pay for as much as you want and train on the rest with semi-supervised learning. This makes it more label efficient, and it scales to complicated models and tasks. For example, CIFAR-10, a moderately complicated image um, classification data set, with 250 queries using just the labeled data set, you can get around 54% accuracy. 
using uh, the unlabeled data with semi-supervised learning, you get around 88%. Huge gains. However, learning-based approaches have uh, a fundamental limit in non-determinism. Consider the following setting. Alice queries on her, for her data and then trains two different models. These models differ only in their non-determinism. The non-determinism in learning is the initialization you start training from, uh, random batch order in STD, and GPU non-determinism, floating point uh, errors um, in the order of additions add up. It turns out that if you control for everything but GPU non-determinism, the two models end up being um, on, on fashion and NIST if you, if you train these two. You end up with two models that differ on 6% of the test set, controlling everything but GPU non-determinism. So um, Alice could not have gotten fidelity on these 6% of examples. In order to overcome this, we turn to direct recovery. The linear model approach uh, that I discussed earlier doesn't really extend to neural networks, but fortunately, Millie et al. at FATSTAR 2018 show how to do this with two-layer ReLU networks. A ReLU, if you're not aware, takes the input, and if it's positive, does nothing to it, and if it's negative, squishes it up to zero. For this, I'm going to describe kind of the main idea of the Millie et al. work um, and a little bit of how we improve on it, but if you want more details, you're going to have to see the paper. So to start, we need to get a little bit of intuition for how a ReLU network operates. So a ReLU splits input space into two pieces, the place where the input's positive and the place where the input to the ReLU is negative uh, because it's a piecewise linear function. So this means if you have k ReLUs, um, you have two to the k regions of input space. And so um, this, if you tried to brute force this, it would be very inefficient. The key idea of the Millie et al. work is that you don't need to brute force. If you find a, a boundary where a single ReLU changes from positive to negative, um, then observing the difference in the functional behavior in these two regions gives you the weights of the ReLU. So in order to do this, first, we need to find the boundary. I'm not going to describe how to do that, but it's a fairly simple procedure. And now I'll try to explain how you recover these weights. So what you do is here we have um, one boundary. The first ReLU changes from on to off. On the left-hand side, consider what happens when we change the first ReLU by a little bit. Because of this perturbation, um, this, this perturbation will propagate to both the ReLUs, and then the ReLUs are both on, so their changes propagate to the output. In the other exam er, on the other side, where the, the first ReLU is off, the same change propagates to both the ReLUs just the same, but because the ReLU is off, it doesn't propagate through it. And so the uh, output behavior only matters um, based on the second ReLU. And so what you can do is you can subtract these contributions and get the behavior of the first ReLU with this input. You do this for all inputs, all ReLUs, you recover all the weights. It's a little more complicated than this, but um, if, again, you're going to have to go to the paper for more details. So our improvements are to make this work in practice. Milli et al. was uh, proposed in theory, so it required real valued arithmetic, and it doesn't work if you move to uh, floating point numbers. So we made it work in floating point 64 by improving uh, the search and improving the precision of the the numerical algorithms. And the search is the search for the boundaries. Um, and so at the end of the day, you get um, and with 600,000 queries, you can query an MNIST model with 100,000 parameters and recover it with 99.98% fidelity on the test set. So uh, we only got to touch a little bit on the, the results of the paper, but there's some cool things that um, I didn't get to, to talk about. My favorites are hardness results for model extraction, a finer look at the non-determinism impact, and hybrid attacks, where you can use learning to improve the functionally equivalent attack. Um, our, our work really highlights a lot of open questions for future work, including making more efficient, realistic, effective attacks, 
um, you can actually see uh, ICML um, or Crypto 2020, there are improvements on, um, on the functionally equivalent attacks that make them work for deeper networks. And another thing is our taxonomy actually Im improves a lot, uh, or sorry, allows us to consider defenses for model extraction. For example, um, now we can, we have a reasonable question, is functionally equivalent extraction easier to defend against than accuracy extraction? Um, and defenses can be designed for each goal and for the other parameters of the adversary as well. Um, with that, come to my uh, Q&A to ask me questions. Thank you.